Hello everyone, my name is Conrad on behalf of Camera Stuff and welcome to yet another In the Limelight interview. Today joining us is Taryn Goldman, who is a very exceptionally good conceptual and portrait photographer and I'm assuming other types of photography as well. Hello Taryn, how are you doing? Hi, 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 how's it guys? Welcome everyone. Okay, awesome. So we have plenty of things to discuss today. Um, as per normal, I'm just going to wait um, a couple of minutes just for more people to join. But I think in the meantime, let's just remind everyone that um, in the comments section, you're welcome to ask your questions and we will tackle them as we go along. Um, yeah, so that profile picture of my, sorry, we just spoke off air. You know, that was taken in a my bedroom like 10 years ago. It's something I need to update at some point, you know, one, one of the dinosaurs. Uh, I, I absolutely love that photo. I actually can remember seeing it as when I first started photography. I remember thinking, geez, that guy's so good. Like, and it's just so, <laughs> it's just such a different profile picture. It's just, it's a really great image. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's my favorite one, and I hesitate to get rid of it, but it needs to be updated. I've gotten old in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we all? <laughs> all right. So, also, as another reminder, if you're watching this in one of our Facebook groups, um, I can't see your name. So, it comes up as Facebook user. So if you're watching this in the Facebook groups, um, just pop in your name as well so we know who's talking. All right, so I think we have a bunch of people already. Okay, so I think we're going to get started. All right, Taryn. Um, so the questions are going to pop up here in the bottom left-hand corner. So just to get us started, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, well, I am a full-time photographer. Um, I've been doing photography for about 12 years now, something like that. Um, it was a bit of a strange start. Uh, my dad passed away and um, I moved to Joburg and uh, I started hanging out with my godfather who was a cameraman for the BBC for about 20 odd years. And um, he walked like my dad and he talked like my dad. And so I just wanted to hang around him and he gave me a camera one day and he's like, here we go, just go and have some fun. And, I literally just turned 30, I think. And um, I picked it up and two weeks later, I was like, now I'm a photographer, give me your money. I quit my job and I just went for it. And that was literally 12 years ago. Um, I'm interested in all kinds of photography, um, but I think I found my passion with portrait photography. Um, I used to do a lot of events like music events for um, you know, Ultra and H2O and all of that, but I really think portrait photography, you get to stretch yourself a little bit because there's so many different kinds of people and try and mm -hmm. tell a story. Yeah, and that's about it. I've got a, a daughter who's 15. He's the love of my life. But other than that, I'm pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. All right, just to show how not boring you are, I'm just going to give people a bit of a taste as to what you are capable of. So I'm just going to run through a slideshow here. Um, now, just to quickly... Let people see what Taryn here is capable of. Now, so a bunch of incredible photography here. And we're going to talk about it as we go along. So in conjunction with the interview, we're going to talk about these images one by one as well. All right. So let's do our next question. So I think for the folks who are interested in gear and whatnot, let's get a bit of a, an introduction to, as to what is in your camera bag. So that's um, that. Uh, so at the moment, I've got a Fuji XT2. Um, mm -hmm. I come from a Canon. I've been shooting Canon for about eight, nine years. Um, and then just when lockdown happened, just before lockdown happened, I looked at my cam my cameras. I had a uh, six five uh, D Mark III, and I looked at my camera, and it was like eighty percent actuation. And I was like, oh, I need to get something new. And the price of the new cameras is just really, really expensive so um i had a look at the murders and um fuji are very competitive with their prices um and um i basically did a swap so i i swapped over my canon 5d mark III. i got a fuji xt2 almost brand new um, i swapped my three lenses i've got a it's a bit of a taking getting used to because it's uh, not a full frame obviously so i've got a equivalent of a 50 mil i've got a 35 mil um i've got mm -hmm. a a very wide angle. I've got a 14 to 21, I think. And then um, 
uh, 24 to 105. It's quite a wide range of kind of uh, apertures as they go, you know. And then mm -hmm. I've got two studio lights. I've got a Q2 Godox 8200s, which um, I live and breathe. Okay, I love them. They're fantastic. <laughs> yeah. oh, those 8200s are great. All right. So a bit, a bit off on topic here. So jumping from full frame to mirrorless, um, what was that jump like? Um, do you see the advantages of mirrorless um, you know, besides the pricing? Like I know it's one of those big arguments online comparing mirrorless to the old DSLRs. Um, is it something that you find interesting to be debate itself or is it just a matter um, of taste? I, I think it's just a matter of taste. Look, the mirrorless took me a long time to get, you to, uh, to get used to. I, I didn't find it easy at all. Um, it was a very steep learning curve for me um, when I went into Fuji. I, I still like I've still got to look at the menu and try and find where things are. It doesn't come. Canon I find comes very naturally. Like um, the user uh, preface is very very easy for for, my, well, for myself anyway. Um, and the color is different. The color is very different. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, if I shoot in RAW, so I, I can change it in in on, after the fact. But um, the color that comes out of the camera, I find very very kind of stairs to almost purple. I don't know if it's just my eyes or, but I found that to be the major difference. Um, other than that, you know, it's, I think it's just preference of what do you, what do you enjoy? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I didn't find the, 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 the swap over very easy at all. It took me about a year to get used to it. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm still one of those, but still use the DSLR. But yeah, I think my personal in, um, input on this, it just depends on what feels better in your hands and if the mirrorless does make sense to you. But all things considered, just, you know, the camera system doesn't make you a better photographer. It just kind of depends on the, um, you know, what you are used to in your hands. Yeah, no, look, I mean, if I had the option, I would, I would, I miss my 5D Mark III. But I, I will say one thing, the Fuji system is much lighter much mm. lighter so it's a lot less strain on your body and your your personal like lugging it everywhere um I, I, my whole system plus my lights fit into a camera bag whereas before with my with my canon never in a million years would have that all fit into one camera bag so it's a lot less to lug around so practically it's a lot easier oh gosh yeah, i can say something about that as well so the camera i use is a pentax k1 is one of those big chunky full frames and after every photo shoot, I feel it in my neck and my arms the next morning. <laughs> exactly. That was my worst. Just tracking, tracking, checking mm. around like H2O for 12 hours. With, I used to have a, a cowboy belt that I made myself with two leather pockets. I used to put oh, my gosh. lenses in there. And then I used to have two cameras. And I promise you, by the end of that day, I was absolutely exhausted. Mm. Ready for bed. Yeah, I feel the pain. All right. So let's talk about your career. So broadly speaking, what would you say are your top three proudest photography moments? Um, so they've actually happened in the last maybe year or two. It's taken about 10 years to get started. But um, I think the first one is um, I had a, a magazine called Object, which is quite a new magazine in South Africa, contact me to do an actual interview once they'd seen um, a shoot I did online. And I thought it was just a little interview, but it was like a... I think it was an eight-page spread or something like that, and this woman mm. came to interview my house, and it was, um, you know, you, you hear about imposter syndrome all the time, and I, I constantly have to push that down. But um, when this <laughs> came out, um, I was very proud to see my stuff in print and and to have the recognition from it. Um, but, yeah, uh, it was a great experience. Then... Um, I had a, a guy a guy who runs a photographer. I never know how to say that. I'm always going to butcher it. The photographer. Uh, <laughs> but I, I've been like reading that, his yeah. stuff. Something like that. He, I've been reading his stuff for years. And um, he also got a hold of a series that I did called The Painted Girl, where I literally painted women. Um, oh, this one was for, sorry, Carl Taylor. Um, I don't okay. know if you know Carl Taylor, but he's a, a very well-known products and kind of lifestyle photographer and um and this was sorry this was for the photographer but yeah so he i'm not making any sense he got hold of me for the painted girl and then he published these in the photographer photographer um 
on their website and everything. And that was also just a very proud moment for me. I know he's international and stuff like that. Okay, and awesome. then um, Carl Taylor was just another one being published. Uh, Carl Taylor, who's a fairly infamous kind of famous photographer, product photographer, mentioned me in one of his chats. And I was just like, wow, Carl Taylor is talking about me. That's so cool. Um, and yeah, that's that's about it. There's just kind of, I don't know if it would make everyone proud, but yeah, it's just stuff that I I enjoyed, you know, getting the recognition from other well, really well-known professionals. Um certainly did a job for me. Yeah, so in reference to the Painted Girl, you are a couple of them, and we'll definitely talk about these as well. And you also sent me a video so we can get some behind the scene action here as yeah. well. So if you're interested in all of this, do stick around. We're going to talk about these images one by one. Yeah, but certainly a lot to be free, um, to be proud of, um, to get featured in a magazine and for other people to um, yeah, want to publish your work. And I think these are the checkpoints we all strive towards as photographers. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to, uh, you know, not to not to ride yourself on that, but to feel like you are recognized um, in an industry. Mm. I mean, the photography industry is quite small in Joburg. I mean, everyone kind of knows. Not, it's not tiny, but I mean, everyone, a lot of the top photographers know each other. Um, and to be recognized, um, you know, any way, shape or form, especially internationally, is important. But I don't write everything mm. on it, you know. It, if it didn't have happened, it wouldn't have changed my, my career in any way, shape or form. All right. Makes sense. All right. So in regards to the conceptualization process, um, now tell us how you go about taking your plans and kind of fulfilling the plan on photo. So what is the step-by-step -step guide to you? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's a messy. Um, it's a very, very messy process. Um, I will often get inspired by other photographers or random things that I see or art. I grew up with a lot of art or movies or, you know, um, series or whatever. And then I think, oh, that would be a great idea. And then I think about it a little bit more. And I'm quite, um, I like to shoot tomorrow. You know, I want to organize it, but I want to be able to shoot it. I don't like to wait for three or four or five months or whatever. So mm. as soon as I've got the concept nailed down, I will go online and I'll have a look if anyone else has done it before. Um, and if they have, I'll try and see how do I make it better or make it my own. Um, otherwise, I will find images that will kind of complement it and create a mood board. And then I go about speaking to a team. So like makeup artist, model, um, depends how big the, 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 the shoot is, but sometimes a stylist. Um, and then I literally try and plan it for as soon as possible. So the idea is still fresh in my head, but it's, um, it's a lot of kind of, I, I, don't, I also say I shoot to the fly. So I may have an idea in my head that I've got this concept of how I think it's going to turn out, but then on the day something will happen or mm. it won't go exactly the way I want it. And things will, and you just have to be kind of creative on the fly to make it better. I know it looks good on camera and I know what shots I'm looking for. Um, so if it's it's very different to commercial work, say, where I know people plan in advance and everything has to go according to T, but I'm, it's my image so I can kind of create as I go. And that's what I like about it. That's that's a fun for personal conceptualized shoot, should I say. Mm. Yeah, I find personally the more I plan, the more stressed out to become <laughs> during the photo shoot itself. Absolutely. So yeah, Mm, yeah, you know, so to kind of go on a fly, you know, have some basis as to what you need to do, but kind of need to allow things to happen, kind of just you know, fall into place on the day as well. If there's if there's big things you need to organize, you obviously need to organize beforehand, like clothing or smoke machine mm. or you know that has to be organized. But the general nitty gritty of the images, I find I always have an idea, but then go very differently on the day. So yeah, like you say, it's it's. A little bit of freedom is always good for the soul. Mm, yeah, I find it with a model as well. Like I haven't met for model before. You know, sometimes on a day, what I had planned in my head, you know, he or she just does something or flourishes in a very different way, and you just have to go with that yes. flow as well. Absolutely. I mean, a model is a huge important part. Obviously, she's the one mm. in the image, and um, I've got a couple of models um, that I 
work with and I've got a, a lovely girl who is very um I use her a, a lot because she's so transformative she's like a comedian she can be anyone and she's very good at um shape her body so I basically tell her more or less what I need and then she just kind of goes with it and she's great because I can literally put a wig on her and she looks like someone completely different um but I understand what you're saying when you when you get a model who um doesn't necessarily how to know how to model is it's very difficult to pull it out of them you know to try and um yank the ability to model out of them mm. and and um i think a model is super important well this is where the experience steps in so you know just from our side as photographers just to help people in the right direction as well it's just to find that yeah you know, some people have different sparks as i like to call it and you know they flourish in different Absolutely. ways Absolutely. I mean, it's very different from a client. You know, a client that you get, you, you you don't have the option to have a client that models, you know, otherwise they wouldn't be asking mm. you for a photograph. But um, I think that, uh, you know, if you're working with a client, you've got to work with whoever you've got. And some people are very uncomfortable in front of the camera. Um, and your role as a photographer is to make them feel completely at ease and completely, because the more comfortable they are, the more natural they're going to appear. And yeah. That's going to relate onto camera very, very definitely. All right. So we have our first question from an audience member. All right. So photo manipulation or in camera, which do you prefer? Oh, gosh. Um, I really try to get everything I can in camera. And I've, I've learned that over years and years of experience is that Whenever you think it's going to be easy in Photoshop, it never, never is. And there's always something that is, um, you know, you haven't, you haven't, you haven't thought of, or you, the light is different, or the temperature of the light is different. And to change that in Photoshop afterwards um, is always, it makes the image look less if you don't know how to do it properly. So I'm, I'm a self-taught um, Photoshop artist, and um, I've literally taught everything that I know. So I don't know everything. I don't have this incredibly wide field of knowledge as far as it comes to Photoshop, but I know what I like. To, like I learned by going YouTube. Okay. How do you replace a limb? How do you, um, you know, swap a head or whatever. And that's how I learned, but I prefer to get everything in camera. And then I like to play with um, Photoshop is fantastic for, for color grading for me, or um, let's say, uh, you know, for gentle kind of, transformations if i want to do a proper composite that's a different story then i'll shoot something on a plain background um but yeah i prefer in camera but i love to do photo manipulation as well mm. answers your question no certainly does all right so next question from our side how do you avoid losing inspiration so how do you keep the creative juices flowing so my previous Gosh, workshop um, we spoke about lighter's block so it's opposed to writer's block so how do you get over the quote unquote like this block. Um so at the beginning, I think it was oh, my, my time is all jumbled up. Um I think just before lockdown, what what year was that? That was 2017. I yeah think. gosh, uh Something I like, think our, all of our brains are scrambled as far as the no, it's, it's so, so after the I I think I hit like year nine of doing photography and it might was very quiet for some reason. And um, I just had a major lapse in kind of inspiration. I did not want to pick up a camera at all. And um, I did not want to deal with clients. I did not want to do um, nothing. And I literally lasted like seven months. It was really quite scary. It was, I did the jobs that I had to just stay alive, but I was not interested. And I actually kept thinking like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I... I don't want to change jobs, but I don't want to do this job anymore. What, what am I going to go and get a normal job? Or, and I'm um, actually watching a inspirational video on writer's block or, you know, the equivalent of the artist um, from yeah. a uh, South African YouTuber actually got me out of it. But it's very difficult not to avoid losing, or it's very difficult to, um, to feel inspired all the time. But yeah. um, I think what I do is I just, I, enrich my life with a lot of things that I so I'm constantly taking in content um, from the news to the 
videos to TV to reading. I love reading to museums and art galleries. And I make sure my life is full. I'm busy doing a pottery course at the moment. And through that, I meet different people. And I've just always got the fact that I work in the back of my head, like photography going in the back of my head, like wonder if this person would look good for a shoot or you know, I'm not I'm not um against like walking up to a complete stranger in the middle of the road and saying like listen I'm a photographer I'm not a weirdo I promise would you like to pose for uh you know a photo shoot and people are often like mm-hmm. oh my god that's so weird but um you've just got to keep yourself it's a, it's a process you have to keep yourself alive and keep yourself interested in your art and keep yourself read um on the latest you know functionalities of the art industry as far as gadgets go or people go and and then across the world just um, make yourself interested in art and drama and life in general that's i basically do that i take in a lot yeah, of can, content yeah. yeah i can truly emphasize with that um during the pandemic era um you know that has hit a lot of people very hard some more than others and i think that separation also didn't do inspiration a lot of good as well because you now we are social beings and we need to bounce off one another and uh with that taken away i think a lot of us just dropped um with motivation and inspiration so luckily things are somewhat back to normal and you know we can bounce off one another again get it back into groups Absolutely. talk debate have discourses etc um yeah so good for that i mean during during during, during i actually must be honest i loved actual lockdown I was fortunate enough to stay with my mom. So it was just myself, my mom and my daughter. And we stayed at our home. And it was really nice in the fact I didn't have to see any clients. I just kind of got over that inspiration thing. I just got a new camera. So I had to play with a new camera. And um, Andre Badenhorst uh, had this mm. uh, group called ISO Group. It was just like a group chat where he got a number of photographers together. And he held a weekly competition. And um, that was really, really, really fundamental and actually keeping my brain screwed on in the right way. So every mm. week we used to have to come up with a new image and, and then he would judge it like every week. And it was really, really fantastic. Um, and uh, I love lockdown. I must be honest, I didn't have to see anyone. I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> um, and I got to be creative for the first time. But like without any other than I couldn't go to a hardware store, which was a disaster, um, but I got to really be creative and and that's actually where my whole kind of journey with fantasy began was during lockdown, funny enough. Okay. Because I started playing on the computer with Photoshop and stuff like that. Yeah. All right. So I think on topic, how do you bring the you into your photography in essence? How do you make sure your photography has its own quote unquote talent flavored? And what advice would you give other photographers who are struggling to find their own uniqueness in their brand of photography stop stressing about it really it's not i mean i think i only realized that i had a taran kind of feel to my photographs um a year and a half two years ago i really didn't know that and i, and I used to struggle it was one of the questions i used to ask, ask myself constantly is how do i how do i make people know that this is my image and when you've been doing it for a certain amount of time, people, you, you just develop styles and whether you shoot people, or whether you shoot things, without realizing it, you just automatically go to that angle or that height or that. And so your work will have a natural progression of who you are and people will be able to pick that up. Um, I realized that I love uh, cooler colors. I don't love warmer colors. So that has kind of been a theme. But that's just because I like that kind of color it wasn't an intentional this is going to be my look and feel but really stop uh, to other photographers i'd say stop worrying about it it's really really not you will develop it as you get experience and time um will be the most important things in developing who you are and your style as a photographer it's got very little to, if you try and force it you will find that you don't um stick to it because you will find something else that interests you or another look that interests you and it won't be truly you who you are will come across in photography because you like or you don't like things and the way things sit. Look, that's my opinion anyway. I, I definitely resonate with that. Um, you know, some good words there. For more you force it, for more you kind of go into reverse. Um, so very good Absolutely. advice there. All right. So if you don't mind, we have a bunch of comments, um, not specifically mm-hmm. questions. Um, 
but to kind of pat you on the back, I'm just going to pass on some compliments here. So from Brendan, good advice. And from Daniel, Thank hi, you. amazing work. Thank you very much. And somebody who you may know, Ashley Murray Miles. Sorry uh, I'm late, but here I am now. Another <laughs> <laughs> um, phenomenal from photographer. Brendan. Oh, yes, absolutely. We had her on the previous time. Uh, your work yes, is phenomenal. Yes, cool. Well done, Brendan. Say again. Um, Thank you. Yeah, very nice. Love it. Again, if you're commenting from a Facebook group, we don't get your name. So just comment your name if you're on a Facebook group watching this. And here's a question. Oh, I've got a couple of questions. Sure. Okay, so where are you based? Maybe I will pass by and pop in one day. All right, so just pass so, in your name as well. But yeah, where are you based? I'm, I'm in Kailami in Midrand. Um, I moved here 10 years ago. I love it, so it's not um, it's not too central, so I'm not in the middle of Sandton or Four Ways, but it's five minutes to everywhere. So, But I, so I work from my home. So I'll have to know who you are before I give you my address. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'd love to see uh, people. Yeah, sure. Of course. Um, another question. So how do you come up with such amazing concepts? I kind of touched on it before, but um, no, it's I don't just, know. You know, know world, talk about the world. Living in the world. Um, mm. Magazines and books and art. You know, I love art and the old masters. Um do such phenomenal work, the old painters, not photographers so much, but obviously, um, and other photographers. I mean, I'm I'm in awe of other photographers. I love um, how they present their work. I've got a couple of other photographers. I'll put them in a list down below that you guys can go and have a look at um, that are really, really incredible, incredible photographers. Um, but yeah, it's just the world around me, an idea, a dream. That's basically it. Yeah, so good answer. All right, so this um, interview you had was at Object Magazine. I think we can drop that PDF in yeah. the comment section as well so people can have a look at that. But there's an interesting thing that you touched on that I did find quite intriguing, uh, something you mentioned about fast fashion. Um, so tell us a little bit more about that. So I actually even wrote down some things for this. So basically fast fashion is the world that we're living in, um, the consumption of textiles as a world it's just it's increased in exponentially since say the 1980s they say that um, the americans are buying five times more textiles on a yearly basis each person five times more than they did on a, on a yearly basis um and i think i've got i've got the numbers here that they said um Every average American household produces 32 kilograms of textile waste every year. Um, we, fashion industry as a whole, contributes to nearly 10% of global gas, emission, gas emissions. That's through making the, the products and obviously throwing them out as well. And I just, um, like if you think a T-shirt takes 2,000 liters of water to, um, to, to make one T-shirt. I mean, that's just... It's insane, you know that, that, that. And if you have a look at, at players like like Zara and H and M and stuff like that, they are really just making fashion faster than people can wear it, and it's all for money. You yeah. know what I mean? We don't need a T-shirt every single week. The fashion industry as a whole used to have, I think, you know, four or five seasons a year. So you know, winter, summer, whatever. Now mm -hmm. they've got fifty-two micro seasons. They've got oh, one. Wow. They're releasing designers are releasing a new fashion range every week and it's just it's um it's too much it's like everything else in the world it's too much so but it's something that i can do something about i can choose to buy less fashion um i can you know, i love fashion but I, I i you know slow fashion is what i appreciate is where i go towards um where they make stuff that's handmade that's really taken the time and the um the effort of where your where your uh, textiles come from um mm. what can you you know stuff that will last you know if i look back my mom's got a bag or two she loves bags and she's got maybe six bags and she's had the same six bags for as long as i can remember um and those bags have lasted at 20 30 40 years they leather is bad. They were expensive for the day, but you don't get that. You don't get that kind of quality. Well, you you don't 
you're starting to again, but you don't really get that anymore. Um, I bought a pair of was Adidas sneakers the other day that uh, maybe a year and a half ago that cost me a thousand three hundred rand, and they were you. I gone through them like within six months. I was like, that's not right. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like I just remember Adidas lasting years and years. I don't know. Maybe I'm from too old, too long ago. But it's just um, the way that we're going through clothing and stuff like that. It's too quick, and it's just something that I feel passionately about. Um, I think that uh, the, the textile industry produces 92 million tons of textile waste every year. Wow. That's a lot of waste. It's a lot of landfills that are being taken up or burned off, create carbon emissions and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah so the topic so was mentioned in this article, um, and it was pointed out that you are going to, you know, you typically reuse everything that you've used before. Um, yeah, so in your major publications, all of this, fashion you know, will be repurposed in the future yes absolutely so like the outfits and stuff like that if i don't i normally will approach a designer and, and get dresses from them i've got a couple of designer um, labels that i've kind of built a relationship up over over time but like the dress that you're seeing in that image i made that from um a mm. piece of material that i'd found that i'd had stored for years i'm a terrible hoarder when it comes to material i i keep all kinds of materials and i literally made that outfit and I put her on stilts and it just gave that kind of feeling that I was going for that kind of slightly alien you don't quite know what what's going on there um, effect but yeah I, I do feel very passionately about it and I think it's uh, you know I teach my daughter not to throw if just something's if something's broken mend it you know you don't have to yeah. darn socks obviously but like if your t-shirt's got a rip in it fix it if you can yeah, so I brought up this topic because I think it relates to the photographer's mindset as well. This kind of fast pace, want you to keep up with the trends and uh, all of the new fancy tricks as far as photography is concerned without actually cultivating your own style, um, trying to align your motivation to something that is a bit more um, sustaining in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think people try to reinvent themselves a little bit too quickly. Um, and I think a better way of going about it, this is a personal opinion, but it's just to kind of keep the good things and incrementally weed out the bad things and kind of just evolve yourself over time. Absolutely. I think that people are very much on a on a track to everything wants to be done today. They want everything mm. yesterday. No one's prepared to wait for something anymore. Um, and, and that's what they want with their persona, with their um, image. They want everything to happen now you know it's, it can't take a, a year or two years to build up your skill level that must mm. happen in a week it's, it just doesn't it just doesn't and um people will be very disappointed and but that's just the way it is things take time anything worth it oh, takes yeah. time absolutely all right so a couple of questions well three in fact are you a wedding photographer and what advice can you give to a beginner who is interested in wedding photography <laughs> Run, <laughs> run very fast. <laughs> I did weddings for a number of years. Um, and I I think that the if you are very passionate about weddings, um, I would, uh, let me say, I would, I would specialize. So if you want to do weddings, do weddings and don't mm. do much else. Um, simply because it is a very saturated industry. Um, and to get clients that are willing to pay is not the easiest thing in the world. You have to build up quite a name. Um, don't offer free weddings. Don't don't say, I'll shoot your wedding for free if you let me be the foot. No, just go and shoot as much as you can and try and find another photographer you can shadow or um, you know assist, even if you're not shooting at the wedding, so you can go see how the whole thing progresses. Um, weddings are great 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 way to kind of learn how to be a photographer because you work with everything from you know the details of the uh yeah. the rings and the shoes and the perfume to working with people to like almost fashion um style so when you're working the dress and it so you you kind of go through a lot of um a very very large range of photography genres when you're doing wedding photography but it's not easy and and it's someone's wedding at the end of the day that's what you mm -hmm. people don't 
they don't they don't want to think about it. Is that if you can't mess it up, you can't say, "Oh, I'm so sorry. Can we reshoot that quickly?" Or if you miss something, it's gone. Or if you do something like, you know, not pack your SD card, or you know, your camera breaks and you don't have a spare camera, you cannot mess up on that day. That's someone's very very special day, and um, people aren't willing to pay what they should. I mean, it's a long, long, long day. It's like a sixteen hours, seventeen hours sometimes. So people aren't really willing to, I didn't find, pay what I feel I'm worth with weddings, unless mm. you go to the top restaurants. And I just didn't have the time or the patience to actually try and get there. I didn't love weddings that much. I ended up doing a couple of weddings a year, um, like five or six or ten or whatever. But after that, it's just, you know, I'd, I'd rather leave it to someone who just does weddings and who loves it. I don't love it enough. Uh, sorry, I think we may have lost Taryn there for a second. Or may have lost me. Yeah, I lost you there All for right. a second, sorry. Oh, welcome back. <laughs> All right, yeah. yeah, so I think a good answer there. So another question from Daniel. Uh, where do you find your models to work with and what advice would you give uh, to someone who is new to the photography world? Um, where do I find models to work with? Um, gosh, you know... Um, it's quite an intimidating thing to try and find a model. Uh, I used to try and approach modeling agencies. Um, I never really had much luck there, but I, just kind of your everyday life. If you if you see a pretty girl, it's a bit more difficult if you're a guy. You don't want to come across like a creep. But uh, if you see a pretty girl, stop and ask them, you know, would you mind shooting for me? Um, you make sure you've got a card. You're very professional. You know, if they want to bring a friend, that's fine. Um I literally just, or, or phone if you know one model, they'll often know, you know, friends and stuff like that. So um, I'll put it out on Facebook. I often put out on Facebook a model call, you know, like um, looking for models to work with. And through that, you'll slowly build up um, kind of a database of people who you know mm. who can do work for you. Um, it's it's all about kind of who you know in, in in the photography world, not really much much about what you know, but who you know, so, and also find people, makeup artists, ask if they know models. Everything is very, very um, connected, you know, network based. So once you've developed your network, ask ask your other people that, that other photographers do you know have any models or you know that that you like to work with. Mm. And what advice mm. would you give to someone who's new? Shoot, 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 shoot as much as you can. As you know, take your camera everywhere with you. Um, yeah, I think that, that is the only thing because through that you will get to know how to shoot. You'll get to know what is expected of you um, and you will work out what you expect in return as well. But shoot, yeah, shoot as much as possible all the time. Okay, that would be my great. Advice. All right, so I see we are 40 minutes in. So let's quickly get into the images, shall we? All right, just going to pop that up. Sure. All right, so what are we going to do now? So just a slideshow I showed you at the beginning of the interview. So we're just going to talk about these one by one. So um, basically, I'm going to pass the ball on to you, Taryn. So I'm going to show you the image and basically just ask you, okay, tell us more. Okay, so this was um, a fabulous shoot. This was taken at Kempton Park um, Abandoned Hospital. Oh, uh, you can't okay. get in there very easily. Um, you have to know someone. I was invited by someone that I know, and we went as a group of photographers. And um, basically, what they did is they said they all bring, they invited a whole bunch of models, and then everyone could swap models every 30 minutes or so. But I decided, no, I don't want to share models with everyone. I want to take my own models. It, it cost me 300 grand or something like that. So I took my own model, I paid for her, I paid for my makeup artist, and I planned this weeks in advance and as I said I made the outfit um and the concept was fast fashion and what 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 world would we be leaving our kids like what would we look if we were in this fabulous kind of outfit in this very derelict world and yeah. that, that was a whole suit that was um, surrounding it and it was just a it was very eerie Kempton Park Hospital is um we run down and um, it's got no water no electricity um You've got to sign an indemnity form to get in there. Um, and in some places it's, it's pitch black. Um, but yeah, you can, I mean, the next images as well were, 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 the, same, were the same shoot. 
but um, it was just, uh, it was a great shoot. My model was an absolute star and uh, my assistant as well was also. And these were all taken in the hospital. It was just fantastic places um, in and around the hospital to to shoot. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to speak about um, fast fashion and, and what, what it's doing to us and what, what, are, what world we're going to be left with if we continue in the way that we are. Uh, this was taken in the same hospital um, on the second floor, which was quite a trip because you had to walk up a very rickety flight of stairs with no light. And um, I basically just did this in Photoshop afterwards. So I, I did the exposure where I, I had her moving around the room and it was just kind of eerie. And that wheelchair that's, that crumpled, everything else is actually at the shoot. That was not put in for Photoshop. That was actually at the shoot. So it was this crumpled old wheelchair. There was syringes all around the place. It was um, it was an interesting oh, day. Yeah, I was about yeah. to say the color was actually <laughs> perfectly here um, with a blues and a yellow Absolutely skirt. Perfect. Very conducive for <laughs> photography. Absolutely. Uh, it's a fabulous it was, shooter. I mean, Thank you. Yeah, the, the 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 whole place. I mean, I, I'd love to go back there, but I've kind of done what I can. But I, I would love to go back and explore a little bit more. Um, I didn't mm. really go too far. I didn't venture too far into it. But yeah, there's some fantastic, very interesting places to shoot. All right. So uh, there's also from the Kempton Park Abandoned Hospital. Um, yeah, it's, it's the same, same thing. We walked into this room, which was, um, I think, the old mess hall or something like that. And it had a little bit of light coming in from the side. And it was very like 1970s. So it was very kind of um, kitsch. You know, if you remember like Afrikaans kind of um, mm. kitsch, kind of muscle and browns and um, dusty and gross. The, the, like the floor and everything was just icky, but it was a great, 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 great place to shoot. Lots and lots of details. Yeah, something Ashley and I spoke about with our interview would be that of the dress flippers. Did you have a couple of dress flippers here as well? <laughs> so I call them my fluffers. Um, but yes, <laughs> I, I grab you what I've got. Um, a, a, a makeup artist, an assistant, a passerby. I've, I've often used my friends as fluffers. But you've got to have a flipper who is available to, mm. to successfully flip the dress. But yeah, they are they're they're not easy to come by. <laughs> All right, so this is the one that uh, we spoke about earlier as well. One of your proudest moments. Yeah. So this uh, was with Carl Taylor. He spoke about this shot. So this was was one of my models, Scarlett. Just wonderful, wonderful model. Um, and I did this shoot with another photographer. We were just playing with gels. I'd never I've never played with gels before. And um, we just took a day and we each got a model and we just played around with with gels. And I just loved uh, the quality of the light and the, I feel like I got it right. I, I mean, the rest, if you have a look at the rest of the images, not every not everyone was as good as this, but for me, I love the the look and the feel. I love the complementary colors and the, mm -hmm. um, I love everything about that image. Yeah, um, but it was, yeah, Carl Taylor introduced it at one of his shows, which was very, pleasing for me oh yeah so working with gels is quite tricky because the exposures are I won't say yeah i will actually say it's a little bit weird with the gels because some gels subtract more light than others so it's not as intuitive as what you absolutely feel with and, white light there. and you think and you think it's just the color but it's not it's um it's how they actually react on a person's skin and what color what mm. what what's your other color light working with and what's your background look like um, like everything in life, it's a lot more complicated than, than it first seems. Um, but yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I actually should play with it a bit more. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to see that. All right. So here with the painted set, I'm very intrigued by this. <laughs> so this was this was um, a, the test project for another set that I was going to do with a friend of mine. But this is my daughter. Um, who rolled her eyes incessantly when I asked her, please <laughs> come and pose. She's been posing for images of mine since she was about six years old. 
Um, and I said, she said, like, what are we going to do this time? And I was like, well, if you don't mind, I'm going to paint you. And she's like, what do you mean you're going to paint me? And I was like, I'm going to paint on you. And what, what had actually happened is um, I, this is around the time that I had joined that, um, that competition, that ISO competition. And they had categories, sorry, the, not the ISO competition, the Africa uh Africa Photo Awards has got a competition mm. and they had two categories it was one was fine art and one was conceptual and I couldn't for the life of me get an answer from them as to what did they mean by conceptual and what did they mean by fine art like and I looked online and no one would explain it to me and to me it was extremely frustrating I understand yes a concept is like a concept but if you have a look at conceptual images out there and you have a look at fine art, there's a very, very fine line that is a difference between the two of them. And I was like, you know what? If if you, if you take a picture of a, a fine art painting, you know, is that conceptual or is it fine art, you know? And and that, I think, just kind of like maybe think, what happens if I paint a fine art painting on someone and take a picture of that? Is that conceptual or is it fine art? And that's what sparked this idea off. And um, I wanted to almost make it feel like she was a painting. So you're like, there's the other one. But they're, I don't know how to explain it other than they're painted. That's literally a man in a room with a light. And they've, I've painted on them. And um, it just, it came out. Oh. mind. No, no. Sorry to oh, interrupt. I go. hope you don't mind if we just played a video. So all of this is actually painted. So none of this was post-production, you know, adding the brush in the yeah, Photoshop or whatnot. Anything. It's literally everything yeah. painting. Even the light source so, has its own little glow as well. Yeah, it, it was, um, this is my very good friend who sat for me um, very patiently. We went through, I think, two bottles of wine and um, <laughs> she, she sat and we just, um, you know, played around and I literally didn't touch these photographs afterwards was Photoshop at all. I literally changed the contrast a little bit um, and, and that was about it and everything else was painted on. But it's a, I, I recently saw someone else has already done it, um, Alexa, Alexa Mead, um, I'll put her name in there. She's also, she's made a whole career out of it, but I've never seen it fun, been done before, but it was a really, really fun day. Um, and yeah, just enjoyable to do if you enjoy painting that is. Gosh, now look at that. Stunning. People don't often realize what they're seeing until you explain mm. it to them. You know? And so actually, the once it, this, this, I was, Oh, sorry? No, this, this went a little bit viral. I got calls from all over the place to do articles on it. Um, and it was quite exciting, yeah. So, you were saying? Yeah, the first time I saw this, I think one of our marketing people asked you to be a photographer of the week and I saw this image and I was just spellbound immediately. I, I thought it was Photoshop, but when you look closer, it's you know, all done in studio. That's why I put a cigarette. If you have a look at the, one of the images, there's actually a cigarette in her hand and that's why I put a cigarette in her hand just so people could see that it's real. It's not Photoshop. It's mm. not, you know. Yeah, so that's exactly it. I just decided to do a guy, a different look. Um I don't think I've no. taken this as far as I can. I think I've still lots more to do, but yeah, I'll have to wait a little while. Wait till it's warmer at least, because I can't have a bottle <laughs> sleep while taking it. It's a little bit cold for that. Oh gosh, yeah, at least it's warming up. It's my first interview without a massive jersey on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's been a cold winter. All right. So let's see what's next. Okay. Also one of my favorites. Yeah, these girls, so these were two, actually one of two girls that um, just kind of stopped me one day and said, you know, would you mind doing a, a shoot with us? You know, whenever you, you need someone for a shoot, please phone us. And they're very pretty girls. Um, and they came around, and I didn't really conceptualize this at all. I literally, I've got a kind of couple of items in my wardrobe that I use and a couple of old wedding dresses that I've managed to actually paint and get messed up and I put them in that and I made a crown and um, those uh, things on her fingers are from China Mall they're just like metal kind of 
I think that I don't want to, you know, do um, appropriation, but I think it's from the Chinese culture where they have those things in the fingers. But um, mm. I just spray painted them black and, um, yeah, I imported that wing from uh, Adobe stock. I, I pay for mm -hmm. Adobe stock and just put it together. But yeah, I love the mood. And this is what I was talking about. My A lot of my work is very blue. Um, I don't like... Mm. Like Ashley's work is very like red and orange and yellows and and mine's is on the other side of the scale like blues and greens and mm. and it's so strange. I mean Ashley, I can remember listening to her interview with you. She was saying, you know, I've often tried to go. I wish I had a blue pair. It's like I love mm. my blue pair. I wish I had a red pair because I could never ever come up with something that's very red and warm and you know. But her work looks spectacular like that, and I, I love my work like this. It's kind of blue undertone almost. Okay, great stuff see what's next all right just um sorry something i wanted to point out would be the practicalities of all of these shoots so all of this um done by hand it's just just the wings in the previous shot that were um you know, downloaded from adobe stock but you know, something i do appreciate would be all the practical effects going into your shoots so this was um very practical because this was about five pillows <laughs> 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 and um, attached with cotton or, or fishing wire to my ceiling. And then I have a wonderful woman who I get dresses from. She is um, a designer for the Viennese Opera, um, and she does oh, all the wow. dresses. So you walk into a studio, and she's just got this incredible array of dresses, and she um, lent me a dress for the shoot. And I thought, oh, I want to do something really light and airy. Um, and so I saw this dress, and then... This went with very well with the kind of clouds and whatever, and then the blue wig, obviously. And this was literally pa I painted that same studio that I painted before. I painted it blue, and then um, I just had these clouds floating everywhere. And um, yeah, I also I love the shoot. Um, I love the hair. I love everything about it. I think I did five different looks on the shoot. It's like the thing is, I don't I don't shoot for. 500 images I will shoot maybe mm. to get five ten maximum out of one shoot um but that's it that's that's all I get out of the shoot really uh so just to confirm you painted the backdrop so from fabric or something also repurposed so, so um you know uh we call it a hardboard that you like mm. it's quite bendy but you can tack it onto a wall I just I I've converted my garage into my studio which is great because I can do whatever I want with it um, with a wall whatever <laughs> I've painted the wall like a normal color but then I have um very big like the back of a cupboard I actually took apart a cupboard that's where I got it from is the back oh, cardboard in a cupboard I know what's it called pdf P, P, um uh, the material uh, pvc um no it's not pvc you know the backing on a cupboard door on the back of a cupboard. That's mm, yeah, that, I know like what you mean. Cardboard. I forget what it's called now. But mm. I use that very, very big sheets of it, and I literally pluck it onto the wall with a couple of nails, and I paint that. So I've got about six sheets of that in my studio, which are constantly being painted and repainted and repainted. So yes, oh, and then gosh, I put wow. candles on the floor. Um, rolls yeah, of I enjoy canvas that very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks spectacular and the repurposing of all of this stuff. Um, now, also here at home, I have so many things I need to use still, but um, no, just plan to, and I kind of enjoy the practicality of it all, just try to create something different. And you know, every time it is something new as well. Absolutely. Um, I think that's probably the biggest enjoyment for me with photography is actually creating a set, a set building. Mm. Um, that is a big, big part of photography for me. I love to create an environment where you can shoot, you know, if you don't have an outside and whatever. Yeah. Um, and I've been collectively hoarding things over years and years and years. Like I never realized why. It was only became when I became a photographer. Oh, that's why I've got those three old suitcases lying yes. in the corner there. That's why I've got, you know, and like 30 different plates or, you know, um, I selectively keep things over many, many years. And, and as a result, I have quite a nice library of different, weird stuff to use you know but i think a lot of photographers are like that i don't know maybe. Mm. yeah no i think you're absolutely right i moved recently and i just have those black containers full of <laughs> props and masks and fabrics and things you know it's 
Always annoying when you need to move, but you always but think like you're going to use it in the future. Again. Oh, yeah. It's and, like Christmas. Yeah, when you try to sort out. Like, Absolutely. Yeah, when you try to sort out everything, then you find everything again. And, oh, you know, you start wearing it by yourself and you're having fun. You think about <laughs> the possibilities for photo shoots and whatnot. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly. something I do enjoy personally as well. All right. So what's next? Okay. This yeah. one I like as well. This was for that competition I was telling you about earlier on, the ISO competition, where, mm -hmm. where they would give you a word each week um, or a letter. I can't remember. Uh, it was a letter. It was a letter, and you would have to come up with a word with the beginning of that letter. So this was, we got H that week, and it was hot-headed was my word for the for the week. And um, okay. it was a competition. Complete fluke. I actually, that bag was really a li like lit in my studio. I didn't realize it would burn so quickly, but it burned very, very quickly. It was not her in it. It was on a, on a broom handle, but she was holding the broom handle while this bag burned. And then <laughs> I literally kind of shoved it onto her. And um, I just, I love that the stance that she's got, she's just kind of sitting there very casually and this head is on fire. Um, yeah, I just love that image. But it was for competition. But it was hot head was a the word we had to we we had to come up with a, a concept for that. Yeah, so we had a couple of questions concerning how do you get going with a concept. So these um, competitions that you um, partook in, um, especially the ASA one that we did during the pandemic. So if I recall. Re correctly they had different words on a spinning wheel and they would spin the that's wheel right. and kind of need to build so do you think that's a good idea just to kind of do among yourself um so if you're lacking inspiration just put words on a spinning board and just do whatever the thing lands on i love that concept i absolutely love that concept i think it's a great idea if you really want to stretch your uh, imagination, it's um, a wonderful way to do it. You know, if you're ever stuck, you don't know what to shoot, you yeah. can't think of something to shoot. Words are fantastic kind of examples to really get you, because if you, even if you don't come up with a concept from that, it'll get the wheels turning, it'll get your head thinking in a in a lateral kind of direction as opposed to just mm. a vertical, that's how everything is. So yes, I do, I think it's a fantastic idea and I would definitely recommend it. And, and people want it for inspiration, shoot other um, competitions, enter competitions, you know. Mm. Um, you, you never know, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Now, something I planned on doing, I just wondered why I didn't continue doing it. Um, yes, it happened quite a while ago. I did the spinning board thing. So on one board, I had have a color, and on a different board, I have an object. So it kind of lands on orange and then uh, whatever object, and I need to construct a concept out of the two. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm definitely on board really? with you saying that it's definitely a good idea to do something like that. Yeah, you should do a competition on free camera stuff and see what happens. Get yeah, you lots a good of exposure, idea. I guess, mm. do that. All right. Okay, it's in the pipeline. So <laughs> check go. it out in future. We're definitely going to do that. All right, so next image. Okay, tell us about this one. So this was for during lockdown, actually. <laughs> um I managed to get my friend out, and it was for um, another competition, actually. Uh, was fish out of water was the concept. And um, jacaranda trees were in bloom that year, and I thought, oh, I need to do something with the jacaranda trees. And I thought, okay, I've got this dress. And then the, I used uh, my friend who was a model, and I thought, what's the complementary kind of the opposite color of purple is orange. Okay, goldfish, fish out of water. And that's just kind of how the – idea developed and um yeah it was literally during lockdown so we had to run out in the middle of the afternoon kind of camera in hand and um, quickly go stand in the middle of the road with this fish bowl and whatever so the fish aren't there but the fish bowl is and the um origami fish at the bottom are there and the water is there so we were lugging around a bucket of water and then we had to quickly take a photograph before anyone else saw us and we got arrested but it was a it was a fun day. But yeah, you're wondering where the concept come from. That's how it happened. Gosh, yeah. So those are origami fish. Didn't notice. Mm -hmm. How clever. That's super clever. Yeah, that's that was that so, was uh, I didn't have time to kind of position them so you could see that they're fish, but they are in fact little origami fish that I spent hours and hours trying to fold and get ready. But 
Yeah, that was a concept. Mm. Yeah, Sam, I'm picking up a theme here. So kind of on the fly photography, thinking on your feet. Is that a fair assumption or estimation of what you're doing? So yeah, absolutely. just allowing things to quickly um, happen. So to have a an idea, but just allowing things to just unfold on a day. I don't. I don't think I'm. I'm calm enough to let something sit and stew for hours and hours and hours. Mm. I'll for, or days or weeks or months. I will forget about it. So I literally like to come up with an idea and shoot it. And that's when I've found that I get the the best kind of. Because often my first idea is my best. I if I sit and I stew around and I play and I I don't come up with anything often better than my first idea. So my first idea I like to. And think of it, and if I've got the, the availability, like a model and the dress and whatever, then I go for it and I shoot it. Um, I'm not a very thoughtful photographer, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, it certainly produces a lot of fantastic images. All right, so Thank you. let's do this one. So this was um, part of a series that I had done where I was convinced I was going to shoot the entire library of fairy tales. So I think I started off with Alice in Wonderland and I did a shoot around that and then I went and I did Red Riding Hood um, and I did that and then this was the Snow Queen. And I always try and think, you know, how can I make something not necessarily sort of different to the original. I didn't want to have, you know, this white girl with the white hair and whatever. And I thought, you know, something extremely African is just to use this beautiful regal woman. And so, I mean, she's a model, she's a wonderful, wonderful woman. And I had a makeup artist come in and she kind of put snow, kind of fake snow on her, her eyebrows and her lips. Um, and this was an old wedding dress that I told you I had. And I got a snow machine. And the duplication just happened by chance when I was playing around with Photoshop afterwards. I thought, oh, she got these two images that so she hadn't actually moved her body, but she'd moved her head slightly. And I thought, oh, that would be amazing to put like I have opposite each other. And it's actually stayed one of my favorite shoots um, for ages. But yeah, it was supposed to be the Snow Queen, a, a fairy tale version of the Snow Queen. Yeah, so very practical stuff again. So the snow machine, where do one find a snow machine? So parties, place, same place you'd find a bubble, a bubble machine, you know. So you go to a place that rents them. I think that was cost me about two hundred bucks to rent for the day, oh, okay. and then you've got to buy the oh, bubbles okay. and whatever, and you can rent a snow machine, you know. I, I want to eventually own all of those things. I want to own a mist machine, and I want to own a, you know, um, <laughs> a bubble machine and all of that. But yeah, they're going to start a Hollywood studio sometime soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, one of my favorite photographers, Gregory, <laughs> Gregory Christen, has, has got uh, his productions on such a huge scale. He, um, I think, he like he he's complete opposite to me. He plans photography over months or years almost, and just to film this one image, um, and like he's literally got light crews and sets and production. I mean, it's about a hundred man team to produce one image. Mm. But yeah, that's eventually what I'd like to get to. All right, so we still have a lot of people still watching. So we're going to talk about a workshop you have planned for the future. So we're just going to uh, talk about that. So let me just get yeah. that on screen. All right, so Taryn is indeed going to host a workshop. So that's going to happen the 1st of October. And also as a nice little touch camera stuff is going to sponsor it. So we are offering a 10% discount to all attendees. Uh, but beyond that, Taryn... Do you want to tell us a little bit more about your workshop? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm very excited to, to host this. Um, it's my first workshop, so I've never done this before. Um, I have no idea what it's going to be like, but basically it was just my idea to take people through a, a shoot from start to finish. So how I come up with the concept, um, how I actually visualize creating the mood board, um, getting a team together, dealing with a team, um, make sure everyone finds a place in the same day and then actually shooting the concept. So, or before that, sorry, making the props and making the dresses, how I, uh, you know, if you don't have money to go and buy crowns and stuff like that, I make all of my own crowns. Um, I make most of my own dresses. Um, 
not like a sewing course, but just how I draped the dresses on the models. So to get the, because none of my stuff you could wear out, it would all fall apart. You actually need to just drape it on the model and photograph it for that like 10 minute period. And then um, the actual shooting on the day. So the lighting and what settings I use. Um, and then after that, I'm hoping to do like a workshop with the photography. So they'll come back. Um, and once I've digested the images, I will take them through on a Zoom call. I'll take them through editing the whole photograph from beginning to finish. Oh, wow. um, and it'll be lunch included. So it'll be a fun day, lots of wine. Um, <laughs> yeah, hopefully, I hope, I hope it goes well. I'm very much looking forward to it. All right. So just to go through the workshop outline. Um, yeah. So this is what's going to be covered, how to draw inspiration from everyday life, uh, how to create and build a world in your head with everyday and found objects, how to drape and style material into gorgeous dresses, how to build a beautiful crown. So you're going to do that. So people are going to be supplied with the uh, material to do so. Um, how to work with a team of other creatives, how to Photoshop. So you mentioned the Zoom meeting afterwards as well. How to manage your workflow and how to publish your work. So that's not typical workshop stuff. Um, yeah, so just a, getting a concept and building it from scratch. I think this is definitely worthwhile for anyone wanting to um, yeah, build a style for themselves. Um, yeah, so from my side, I think this is definitely going to be worthwhile. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm hoping to give some answers to questions that I had when I started that no one had the answers for me. You know, I wanted to know all of this mm. stuff when I started and um, I literally just had to learn it myself. Whereas if you come to the workshop, I'll show you how I do it. All right. So to book, they just need to contact you. Um, so we can Absolutely. drop your email address in the comments. I'll do that now. Okay. So while I type, I don't know if there's something else you want to mention. Oh, no, not at all. Um, just, um, yeah, no, no, not really. I think we've, just, we've said it all. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then you can also get me on my telephone number as well. If you go to my page, it's on my page, the workshop. And I've also created an event on the 1st of October. There is um, an event under Town Goldman Photography. Okay, very go. So email address is out there for everyone to yeah to get hold of you. So if you want a book, please do so. As a reminder, um, not all the attendees will get a ten percent camera stuff discount voucher as well. All right, so we covered the workshop. Um, also, in addition to that, I've dropped in your Instagram handle and your website as well. So obviously, we can't cover all of your wonderful concepts, but if you want to explore more of Terence's work, um, yeah, just go to the website and follow her on Instagram and Facebook and whatnot. And yeah, so much inspiration here. Right, fantastic. Thank you so much. That was awesome. All right. Okay, so I have a couple of extra questions for you. Um, sure. I don't know if you have any time constraints, but we can just quickly no, run through all. them. All right, perfect. So... Did it, did it, did it. All right. So what is in your photography dream list? So objects and people, places, events, etc., that you desperately want to take photo shoots um, of and why? Africa Burn is the one place I would love to see mm -hmm. that. Um, just because I think it's an incredible environment that is just very conducive to my style of photography. Um, I think you get some incredible otherworldly shots um, yeah, I just, I'd love to shoot there. I have never shot there, never been, would love to go. Yeah, I think that's also a, a top 10 of mine. Mm. Okay, so in regards to photography, what was the best and worst advice that you've ever received? Best advice would be shoot, shoot, shoot. I said it earlier on, that was the best advice that someone told me. Um, worst advice would be um, you can just fix that in Photoshop because <laughs> it's never true. <laughs> um, it's never, ever, ever true. <laughs> All right. So just a couple of questions here uh, from the audience. So Martin say, I joined late. Will the recording be available on the website? So it's available on YouTube. So after the recording, it will go there automatically. So the camera stuff shop YouTube channel. So it will be aired there automatically, so it will stay there. Um, yeah, so if you have joined late or you want to um, watch this again, yeah, just go to the YouTube channel. So let me perhaps find a link for that. 
Um, yeah, so everything that we do automatically goes to the YouTube channel, it stays on Facebook as well, but I think YouTube is just easier to find all of this. Okay, so while I try and find this, let me just quickly get another question for you. And it's going to be our last question as well, from my side at least. Where do you see yourself in 10 years' time? Um, gosh, uh, I don't really know. I'd love to own a gallery. I'd love to just shoot for me um, and produce what I love to shoot and sell my work as art. Um, it's that imposter syndrome thing. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but I'd love to be there. That's ideally where I'd like to see myself in 10 years' time. Um, just having really gotten to know my craft and gotten to a stage where I can create what I want to create, what's in my head. Um, I'm often constrained by cost and, you know, area of venue, kind of whatever. But I'd love to have it where, you know, like Annie Leverwood, she's got no time constraint, no cost constraint, no, um, you know, on her work. And I think she produces incredible work. So, yeah, that's, I'd love to be there in 10 years' time. All right. So I think, yeah, that's it from me. Um, I don't know if anyone in Facebook or YouTube plan has any other questions to ask you. So we're going to give that two minutes time. So if you're still watching, I see we have a bunch of people still watching. So if you have any questions to ask, you're welcome to do so in the comment section. So I'm going to give that a minute or so. All right. But in the meantime, I'm going to say from my side, this was a spectacular interview. Gained a lot of insight. Really enjoy um, your photography. It was very inspirational. And also to hear from the artist herself. Um, yeah, I think this was a fantastic session. Thank you very much, Conrad. Thank you for having me. Um, it was a great evening. Get to talk about myself all night. I feel quite spoiled. Um, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for everyone uh, who's watching. And I uh, appreciate it. No, we had a lot of attendees today. Um, yeah, so as a reminder, everything will be on the YouTube channel. So if you have missed it, joined late, just go into the link. I dropped it in the comments here. Um, yeah, so directly after this interview, it should be there from uh, the first minute already. Okay, it seems like no questions. All right, perfect. So I think that's it from us. So thank Taryn, once much. again, thank you so much. This was an incredible interview. And um, yeah, that's going to be a goodbye from us. So thank you for joining everybody out there in Facebook and YouTube land. And um, enjoy the night further. So you too, Taryn. You. Hope it's a spectacular night um, as well and a spectacular weekend. As well. Likewise. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Cheers. <sighs>